it's not a matter of if, but when and how bad and forcing them or encouraging them to take a look at their systems, to look and say, okay, have we patched for this? Hello, everyone, and welcome to Caveat, the CyberWire's privacy surveillance law and policy podcast. I'm Dave Bittner, and joining me is my co-host, Ben Yellen, from the University of Maryland Center for Health and Homeland Security. Hello, Ben. Hello, Dave. On today's show, Ben discusses the reluctance on the part of the U.S. and Russia to use offensive cyber tools. I've got the story of the FTC requiring organizations to delete troublesome algorithms. And later in the show, Ben speaks with Liz Wharton from Scythe on the evolving privacy regulatory environment. While this show covers legal topics and Ben is a lawyer, the views expressed do not constitute legal advice. For official legal advice on any of the topics we cover, please contact your attorney. And now a few thoughts from our sponsors at Know Before. What do you do with risk? We hear that you can basically do three things. You can accept it, you can transfer it, or you can reduce it. And of course, you might wind up doing some mix of the three. But consider this. Risk comes in many forms, and it comes from many places, including places you don't necessarily control. Many an organization has been clobbered by something they wish they'd seen coming. So what can you do to see it coming? Later in the show, we'll hear some of Nobefore's ideas on seeing into third-party risk. All right, Ben, let's uh, jump into some stories here. Why don't you start things off for us? So I'm not sure if my story is comforting, and I'm not sure if it's intended to be comforting, but (laughs) I kind of got that feeling coming out of the story. Okay. So it's by Kim Zetter over at Politico, and it is entitled... Now, uh, not the time to go poking around how former U.S. hackers view dealing with Russia. Hmm. And this is about offensive cyber operations. So mm-hmm. obviously there is the actual physical war going on in Ukraine. There's the expectation that that could escalate, particularly if Russia attacks NATO allies. Right. Um, we'd be forced to get involved militarily. But then there's also the second part of this war, and really it's it's what makes this probably the first major hybrid conflict um, in the 21st century, mm-hmm. and that's the offensive cyber operations. And what I found really interesting about this article is there's a reluctance on the part of both U.S. actors and Russian actors to use the most offensive tools in our cyber arsenal hmm. to really inflict the most damage. Mm-hmm. And I felt like I was reading an article from 60 years ago about <laughs> nuclear weapons. Oh, interesting. Because there is the same concept of mutually assured destruction. Uh-huh. So as a little bit of background, I mean, we have been engaged in espionage on Russian networks, uh, on their computer systems for Several years now, sure. um, probably decades, to collect yeah. intelligence. Uh, obviously, our intelligence operations have been relatively successful in that we got a pretty good heads up that this invasion was coming. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's been entire units of our government agencies, the National Security Agency, that has uh, engaged in tactics at least to be prepared for cyber warfare. Mm-hmm. And that includes uh, hacking into Russian systems. So those weapons are available to us. If we were attacked in in some capacity, it is well within our capabilities to do something like attack Russia's critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. The problem and the reason that I think we're very reluctant to do that is they have those retaliatory capabilities as well. Right. So if we attack their critical infrastructure and bring down a power grid in in a major city or disrupt a water system or a sewage system – They have the capability to do that to us. And not only is that going to have extremely detrimental effects on our own citizens, but that too is its own form of escalation that could lead to greater conflict. Mm -hmm. So we're so fearful about some mistake happening in the skies over Ukraine uh, Ukraine that escalates this conflict into a full-fledged war between nuclear powers. And I think cyber operations are also involved in that calculation. We don't want to take any actions that the Putin government in Russia would interpret as an escalation, and that would, in the words of uh, Kim Zetter in this article, trigger a reprisal. Um, So this is a very well-sourced interview. She uh, talked with people who've been involved in 
intelligence gathering and uh, and hacking into Russian systems. Uh, I just I thought it was perhaps a little bit comforting to know that the protection we all get from this concept of mutually assured destruction, at least for now, also applies <laughs> right. we're, to we're sleeping under the warm blanket of mutually assured destruction. Ah, <laughs> sleep well tonight, everybody. We all have nuclear weapons, so right. we're all safe. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it, it, it's interesting to me how um, I think going into this conflict, a lot of folks, certainly outside the intelligence community, uh, were assuming that we would see cyber operations leading the way. Right. That as part of the invasion, they would turn the lights off. They would shut down the networks. And so initially there was a lot of surprise that that didn't happen. And a lot of speculation, you know, why why aren't they turning the lights off? Why aren't they shutting down Very the, good the cellular networks and mm-hmm. so on and so forth? So, um, and I think in retrospect, it turns out that they needed stuff to be on. We've seen stories about how um, the Russian forces are facing all sorts of challenges with their communication systems. And so they're relying on cellular networks, old cellular networks, right. to communicate with their troops uh, so it's it's against their interest to take them down, um, but the retaliatory thing is is of course fascinating as well. Um, I think also part of this, uh, my understanding is that part of this is that um, they they want to hold back on revealing capabilities right. as well. Right. I mean, you have to reserve the sharpest tools in your arsenal for when you would absolutely need them. Yeah. You know, there's also this shadow of doubt within our own government that Russia has the same capabilities that we have. Mm -hmm. We don't know for sure that they could take down our critical infrastructure the way we're pretty sure we could take down their critical infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, But you don't want to F around and find out, so to speak. (laughs) Well, I also wonder, because, you know, again, before this conflict, uh, Ukraine was used as a testing ground by Russia for some of these capabilities. Uh, they famously turned off the lights in Ukraine. Right. Um, so I wonder to what degree after those sort of demonstrative episodes uh, were our own defenses uh, bolstered, right? And so um, – and, and we'll ne- probably never know. Right. <laughs> but, but Hopefully someone's taking care of it out there. But my sense is they are. You know, right. like this has been taken seriously. These threats have been taken seriously. Uh, as you and I have spoken many times, it is one of the few things that still has bipartisan support. So on the cyber uh, realm, things can get done. <laughs> and, and it seems to me like they have been getting done. So. Absolutely. I mean, one thing I will say is – If you had talked to us 22 years ago, Mm. which was Y2K and also we were – there are enough adults in this country who are still in a Cold War mindset. I think Mm. there would have been an anticipation that we might engage in a uh, cyber conflict at some point with another world superpower. Right. For 20 years, we've been not sidetracked but justifiably focused more on counterterrorism operations, which are just very different. Yeah. Um, you're cutting off financial resources to sponsors of terrorism. Um, you're trying to intercept communications uh, for the purpose of intelligence. We, until very recently, just haven't really needed to prepare for this type of conflict, so we're relatively new at it. And it's not just the cyber capabilities. It's also – diplomatic capabilities. Um, So, you know, so just like the people that are hired after a ransomware attack know how to deal with the hostage taker, uh, I think we're just building the capability within our own government to know how to anticipate the next move from our geopolitical adversaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think we're still in a relatively new phase of that. Uh, So I'm, I'm sort of glad that We've had a little bit of time without there being an actual attack on either country to make sure that our capabilities are in order in case we really need them. And I think we have to anticipate that if Putin feels extremely cornered and he runs out of options and he's, you know, has a feeling of of revenge or vengefulness against the West, he might decide to deploy these uh, weapons and we just – we have to be prepared for it. Mm-hmm. It's sort of fascinating that we're – in a way, we're seeing the rules of the road being developed in in real time when it comes to, to these sort of capabilities, right? We have a real conflict in front of us, and so what, whatever the norms are going to be, 
uh, <laughs> accidentally or not, this will be this will set certain precedents, right? Absolutely. Uh, I don't think we anticipated that we'd need to be engaged in this type of warfare as soon as soon as we are, although many within our government uh, ha- have anticipated that Russia would become more aggressive. And there's always been the potential that we'd have to respond to Russian aggression under Article 5 of the NATO treaty, meaning that if they attack another NATO country, we have to be prepared to use every tool in our toolbox. Mm. Even though this is a relatively new capability, you know, some of the same principles that applied throughout the Cold War era still apply. We've been very careful to avoid engaging in any offensive combat in the actual war arena in Ukraine for the same reasons we've been reluctant to use our cyber capabilities, which is just fear of retaliation and not wanting to escalate. Uh, And I think that's a, a very reasonable fear and people are being prudent. But... Just like we conducted, you know, nuclear tests in the Nevada deserts during the 1950s and 60s, I think it's prudent for us to hope for the best but be prepared for the worst. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, well, we will have a link to uh, that story from Politico in the show notes. Uh, My story this week comes from Protocol. This is written by Kate Kay. Uh, And it's titled, The FTC's New Enforcement Weapon Spells Death for Algorithms. Uh, Headline might be a little breathless, (laughs) but the story is quite good. Anything that says death to algorithms (laughs) will raise our eyebrows. (laughs) Right. I should put that as a Google alert. Yeah, I also just makes me, it reminds me that uh, the folks who write the articles are rarely uh, the ones who get to write the headlines. Yeah, they always hate the headlines. (laughs) (laughs) That's not what I meant to say. Right. Right. So this is a a fascinating story. So um, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, recently had a settlement. Uh, This was in early March uh, with WW International. That is the company formerly known as Weight Watchers. And as part of this settlement, uh, Weight Watchers has to destroy algorithms or artificial intelligence models it built using personal information collected through its Kerbo Healthy Eating app. Um, And it collected those from children as young as eight without parental permission. And they also fined the company one and a half million dollars and they ordered it to delete the illegally harvested data. So at issue in this particular case is that um, this Weight Watchers company, they had an app you put on your phone. Uh, It would encourage you to eat healthy, presumably to help you lose weight if that was something you were having trouble with. But um, we have a rule where anything that has to do with kids online uh, has particular privacy rules, and that's COPPA, the – what is it? The Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, right? Mm -hmm. So the FTC found that um, the uh, WW company here was sort of playing fast and loose with how they approached uh, checking the age of people using this app. So they would allow people to put in any number. They were doing no age verification. But then worse than that, if someone went in and get got access to the app by saying they were of age, later on they could change their age to be below what it should be to have access to the app. And the app did nothing. They allowed mm-hmm. them to continue using the app. So that's sort of the, the foundation of what, the, what got the FTC's attention, got their hackles up and, and had them go toward this settlement. But what I find fascinating is this idea that as part of the settlement, they are requiring that this company destroy the algorithms that they were able to create uh, from the harvesting of this data. Mm-hmm. What do you make of this, Ben? It's the first time that we've really seen algorithmic destruction. Uh, This has been an idea that's floated out in academic circles Hmm. and certainly within the FTC among a couple of its commissioners. In the past, we've taken steps short of compelling these companies to destroy their algorithms. Mm -hmm. So we've levied large financial fines. That's a pretty good disincentive. And we force companies to purge uh, ill-begotten data, so data derived from collecting information on children, for example. Mm -hmm. We've seen that in high-profile examples, the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Uh, They mentioned the photo-sharing application uh, company Verable. 
Everalbum. <laughs> Everalbum. Uh, Everalbum. Everalbum. Ever, ever, ever album. album. Ever album. That we, makes we, sense. We did it, Ben. <laughs> I hope the editors keep that in there because yes, that was our, a that was our, a process of discovery our, for our us. Listeners get to hear our brains functioning in real time, for better or worse. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, but I, I do think that this really opens the door for additional cases that might be more high profile. Mm. This is an especially egregious example because it does involve children. And right. as you talked about, even if you were to explicitly change your age to be under the age that would allow you to use the application, they still allowed you to use it and maintain that data. So it's a pretty open and shut case. What happens if there is an algorithm, as we've talked about a million times, that introduces some type of racial socioeconomic bias? Mm. Uh is that going to be ripe for algorithmic destruction? We certainly don't have precedent uh, uh, of that so far. But if somebody has uh, standing to either sue the government or uh, seek administrative penalties from the FTC, somebody could potentially allege that this algorithm, well, uh, you know, it, it, it didn't do something as egregious as collect information from children as young as eight – uh, have these effects of discriminating against people of different races. Mm. Maybe that's going to be an instance where we will reinvoke this new concept of algorithm, algorithmic destruction. Yeah. So it's really uh, you know, putting a flag down on what the FTC's capabilities are, and it's a warning to companies that the FTC can do this if they want to. Right. Uh, nobody's going to stop them, which hopefully will cause companies to look more closely at their algorithms to make sure that they're not violating federal laws. Yeah. I have questions. Uh, how do you— I might have answers. <laughs> well, they're not just, they're more. I think they're mostly rhetorical questions, but how does a company verify that they have destroyed an algorithm? Uh, you know, does, does somebody from the FTC come and look over someone's shoulder when they hit the delete key? You know, I, I don't I don't know the answer to that. I, I suppose there are ways to, um, I don't swear, <laughs> swear under legal penalty that. Right. It under has oath been, that you I, destroy the algorithm. Yeah, yeah. I get, I mean, that would be that's what you do. Right, Ben. I mean, Mr. Lawyer. Under oath. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's probably the best we can do because. Right. A judge is not going to have the institutional knowledge to know whether an algorithm has been deleted. Yeah, uh, they might be able to use their resources to to double check, but certainly they don't have the institutional capabilities to go in and actually make sure that the algorithm has been destroyed. So it might end up being kind of an honor system. The other thing I wonder about is we've seen instances where the FTC has punished a company and they make really superficial changes to something. Mm. So there's a company engaged in practices that are ripping off consumers and the FTC levies a fine. Companies might make a very minimal change to comply with the FTC's requirements, but right. it might not have a significant impact. Right, right. And if you throw a bunch of computer code in front of somebody and say, well, this is different. This is obvious. Look, I mean, any, anyone who— It's got a lot of zeros coder, and ones in it. It's, but, right. Yeah. Anyone who knows code would see how totally different this is from the other algorithm. You know, yeah. <laughs> so but, so the FTC is coming at this using COPPA. Um, one of the things this article points out is that what we're really hoping for is some sort of comprehensive federal privacy law— by the way, they use the term here, algorithmic disgorgement, which I love. Sounds very Orwellian, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, is this a Band-Aid until we get to ha to some somewhere having a federal privacy law? Yeah, right now we have this patchwork of laws that would justify algorithmic dis uh, disgorgement, uh, if you will. <laughs> right. So COPPA is one of them. You could certainly foresee a scenario uh, where HIPAA would be invoked if we're talking about protected health information that's being inadvertently revealed. Mm. There are a variety of other federal laws. It would be much easier if we had a broad federal privacy law, which, of course, we don't have. Uh, and it would be hard to do something like this without statutory authorization. So theoretically, you could try and make a negligence claim, a common law negligence claim, saying you were negligent in handling my PII, for example. Mm. Uh, and that could be grounds for 
you'd have to destroy your algorithm, that's going to be a much more difficult case to make. I see. You have a cause of action under COPPA as it relates to children's online privacy. Yeah. Uh, and you do in a number of limit, a limited number of other circumstances. But it's not going to be a a something that's done broadly until we have a federal privacy law that's geared towards what type of information is allowed to be collected under all circumstances. So it doesn't just relate to uh, online privacy for children. It doesn't just relate to health records, um, but it relates to all information that might be private. There's a uniform federal standard, and the FTC uh, could apply it. But as we know, it's been really hard for Congress to get its act together to pass a federal data privacy law. Mm. And so I don't see any reason why that's going to happen in the immediate future, which is why these other laws, the COPPAs of the world, might be a temporary workaround to just uh, uh, to justify this disgorgement in the meantime. Yeah. All right. Well, that article is from Protocol, again, written by Kate Kay. We will have a link to that in the show notes. Uh, We would love to hear from you. If you have something you'd like for us to discuss, you can email us. It's caveat at thecyberwire.com. So let's return to our sponsor, No Before's Question. How can you see risk coming, especially when that risk comes from third parties? After all, it's not your risk, until it is. Here's step one. Know what those third parties are up to. Know Before has a full GRC platform that helps you do just that. It's called KCM, and its vendor risk management module gives you the insight into your suppliers that you need to be able to assess and manage the risks they might carry with them into your organization. With Know Before's KCM, you can vet, manage, and monitor your third-party vendor's security risk requirements. You'll not only be able to pre-qualify the risk, you'll be able to keep track of that risk as your business relationship evolves. Know Before's standard templates are easy to use, and they give you a consistent, equitable way of understanding risk across your entire supply chain. And as always, you'll get this in an effective automated platform that you'll see in a single pane of glass. You'll manage risk twice as fast at half the cost. Go to kb4.com slash KCM and check out their innovative GRC platform. That's kb4.com slash KCM. Request a demo and see how you can get audits done at half the cost in half the time. And we thank No Before for sponsoring our show. Ben, well, uh, this week uh, we're mixing things up a little bit, and you are taking the interview duties. Uh, You had the pleasure of speaking with Liz Wharton recently. I sure did. I spoke with Liz Wharton from Scythe on the evolving privacy regulatory environment, and I hope uh, you enjoy the interview as much as I did. All right, here's Ben's conversation with Liz Wharton. So I guess to start at a really high level, can you tell us what legal framework there is that encourages or compels companies to protect data? What are the federal statutes um, that that govern that? I know that's a very broad question. I was going to say, take your pick, because it highlights one of the ongoing issues that companies face when deciding kind of uh, who's the boss, so to speak, because you have on the banking side, you have the GLBA. So you have the- Graham Leach Bliley. Yep. I always get that acronym wrong. Right. (laughs) And you have, uh, and you kind of have some upstarts uh, in addition to the federal frameworks and that you have uh, DHS and CISA that are coming in and jumping into the regulatory scheme, but they're hampered. They really don't have our authority outside of either the federal government or critical infrastructure. So on the other side of that and kind of teeing up where I hope we get to talk, is the uh, Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, who has, uh, at least over the last several years, particularly with the Equifax breach, they actually have some enforcement ability and authority. And then we can also 
like I said, talk about or you know, go into some of the other agencies that have tried to jump in, but uh, FTC, starting with Equifax and particularly with the Wyndham uh, Hotels case, have really started that enforcement of, hey, you should be doing a better job of protecting your stuff, your data. What do you think are the limits on FTC's authority? In other words, if we did nothing except empower FTC to have the basically the enforcement authority it has now, would that be sufficient? Or do you think we need additional federal law or, or regulation because there are gaps? That's one of the challenges of are you chasing after with creating additional federal laws? Are you chasing after a specific problem? Or are you looking at the frameworks that you already have? My preference and my leanings tend to be towards, let's look at what we already have in place rather than trying to layer something on top of it and then creating this kind of circus where it's like, well, who am I answering to? Am I trying to figure out this? Am I trying to figure out that? And it gets to part of the notice. You know, do you, did you know that you were breaching or that you had these obligations? Can you explain uh, for the uninitiated what Graham Leach Bliley does and why it applies to cybersecurity and uh, protecting personal information? So, from a high level, what the goals were, or it's part of the know your customer, you know, getting into knowing who you're working with, protecting that. Uh, PII, personally identifiable information. And a lot of people don't realize how deep that that can get, that it's a combination of information that uh, banks, financial institutions, accountants, for example, company I work for, we have to look at, all right, what are we, are we collecting payments? Are we processing things? And if we are, then we probably fall under some of the protections and requirements. And so it and where it picks up with and the action. They it came into being what 1999 and so now 20 years 20 plus years stop doing yeah, the 20, math. 22 maybe? Yeah. Yeah, so I was going to say stop. I don't like to always do the math sometimes. But when you look at all the updates and uh, back in October there was uh, some extensions on really that continuous and not letting companies uh, fall back on that. Well, we did an audit, we did an assessment, we have these, we have these protections so that the data is encrypted, that we're not storing at different places, that we are looking at who's accessing. And the FTC said, "Great, okay, let's expand." And they updated the rules and said, "All right." It's not just that snapshot. What else are you doing? Are you continually, like, you can't just look at it, like I said, one time and say, yep, we checked the box. Good to go. Nothing else we need to do is like, no, you need to continually look at who's accessing that data, making sure that you are using multi-factor authentication and really falling in line with some of the other stuff we saw with the White House's uh, cybersecurity executive order back in May of last year as well. So this applies, because of the jurisdiction of GLBA, this applies largely to financial institutions. When we're talking about other institutions, you know, you have HIPAA that applies to healthcare. You have, as you've talked about, kind of a patchwork of laws depending on the domain. Um, I guess what I'm getting at is there are a lot of companies in the private sector who don't fall under that authority, but still might have PII. I mean, they just might have access to personally identifiable information one way or another. So how do we address those gaps? Well, and that's where you see one, one of the questions being, does CISA need more bite to their bark? Uh, Do we need to expand that? Or do you look at the FTC and say, well, you have this duty to protect the consumers. And are there aspects, and you saw that, that's where with the Equifax, they said, hey, Also with one of my personal favorites is the Wyndham Hotels where, again, you've been breached multiple times. You have failed. This keeps happening. Yes. At some point, you are very aware you are not doing something right. And so now we're going to, you know, put you in a financial timeout. Like we're going to, we're going to make this hurt a little bit and hopefully use that as a wake up call. 
So again, companies should be aware of, hey, if we've seen this happen multiple times or if we are ignoring something that we know could impact our customers, you know, our, those whose data or those whose systems, those who we should be protecting, then maybe we need to take a hard look. Maybe we need to reorganize our priorities and what we were putting off for a while. Eh, let's reassess that. Let's go back and look at it. So I think that makes a lot of sense when it applies to big institutions. You know, Wyndham, for example, certainly has the financial resources <laughs> that they can figure out how to do proper compliance. I guess to play devil's advocate, how would you apply that to smaller organizations that just might not have the institutional know-how to protect against the next, you know, supply chain attack vector? Right. You have these tiny companies that were asking to step up and fight the fight against nation state sponsored actors. Right, exactly. <laughs> and so, Talk about a David versus Goliath story. Right. And the good news is, is that at least from a federal level, and I'd love to see some of the states get in on this as well, that they're realizing, wow, they don't have the resources. So rather than just yelling at them going, you should be eating your vegetables, making them more appealing. Like what is all the cookbooks where it's, here's how to hide the vegetables in your cauliflower crust pizza. Exactly. Uh, Deep fry broccoli with delicious chocolate or something. Yeah. Right. And so you're seeing toolkits and uh, SZA's develop these and put them out there for small and medium-sized companies that a lot of the cybersecurity or information security community is also releasing some of their basic tools. Of course, that also gets into the open source, which, hmm, no problems with open source software and uh, patching and keeping up with that, right? Oh, of course not. Yeah. No, <laughs> no. No controversies have arisen from that, right? No, not at all. But putting those resources and making them available so that you know, you have weapons to defend yourself with against. So I guess that means we have kind of both a carrot and a sticks approach, if you will. Thinking from the perspective of a stakeholder, whether it's a small company, large company, even like a municipality, I'm sure they love the carrots and hate the sticks. So I guess my question is, why do you think the sticks are so important? And do you think FTC enforcement authority being able to actually levy fines in the long run is beneficial for our, our overall national cybersecurity posture? Unfortunately, it's one of those things that when you have companies uh, doing that as risk assessment, doing that decision-making, you know, going through their matrices to say, okay, what gets priority? And particularly, formerly been at the municipal level, uh, you're, you're balancing these priorities, that you're having those conversations the stick becomes important because it, it helps bump some of the things up to the top or it helps shine a light on, hey, we should be doing this continuous assessments. We shouldn't be checking the box. I'm not saying, you know, but you look at perhaps a municipality that I live near now uh, that they go through and it's like, well, if they don't get the cyber policies, if they don't take these steps, then they are going to get hit by the ransomware. And it's not a matter of if, but when, and how bad. And forcing them to look and say, okay, have we patched for this? Uh, forcing them or encouraging them to take a look at their systems and say, oh, does, does log for, are we impacted by log 4J? Spoiler alert, probably. Yeah. Um, and who is it? Right. Yeah. Right. And then having that. So knowing that there's that stick out there that we strongly, uh, or is the FTC, we, we strenuously encourage you remember what we did to Equifax. So please do this. Then also putting in there, and here are links to the resources, that is a great approach. So looking into the future, we had this uh, new rule that was finalized just a couple of months ago that you referenced uh, from the FTC. What do you see as kind of the next frontier of regulatory action? Like in the next three to five years, what do you think some of the next steps are to compel companies to take cybersecurity more seriously? 
Well, and it depends on which battle front you want to look at. I mean, you're going to have CISOs making moves that NSA is also looking at, you know, different government agencies are all kind of saying, hey, maybe this should be my responsibility. We need one ring to rule them all. It's, you know, that battle is going to play out. It's been playing out for many years. I mean, when you look at aviation, uh, cybersecurity, the FAA saying, hey, we, you know, with Boeing and some of the other software vulnerabilities of, like, our job is to protect the national airspace, but it should it be cyber? You see some of it coming to play from the executive order. So I don't know who's who's going to find the precious, but I do see that being one of the battles as well as moving beyond and how do we take that next step from, okay, you check the box. How, how do we further encourage companies nicely or uh, strenuously encourage them to participate or enact the continuous, um, the automated, and so that you don't have, you're not relying on the one pen test, the one vulnerability assessment. We check the box this time. They're reminding them it's an ongoing, it's not even a, a marathon. It's just a never ending hamster wheel of protecting and encrypting and what steps are you taking and are you updating and Again, it's that hamster wheel of continuous, continuous, continuous. You're never done. All right, interesting stuff. Uh, Always interesting to get Liz's perspective on things. Uh, Really insightful and great to have her back. I really appreciate her taking the time for us. Yes. Uh, Liz Wharton is one of my favorite guests. I mean, she's both extremely smart and also has a way of explaining things yeah. um, that I think is is very digestible for our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you know, I, I think a couple of things that struck me in listening to the conversation, um, this whole notion of who has the ultimate authority when it comes to these regulations, you know, it, it sort of it points to what we were talking about in one of our earlier stories about you know, when lacking a an overall federal uh, privacy legislation, you know, we're, we're, we have all these little pieces that we're that we're putting together, and it allows for some finger pointing. It does, and it, it kind of creates a vacuum um, that's swept up by this patchwork of agencies, patchwork of relevant statutes. It's not the most efficient way to resolve these uh, disputes. Yeah. It also struck me, you know, I, I think Liz was right on the money here. She sort of highlighted the the complexity of all of this. Uh, and I love I love her reference to one one uh, one ring to rule them all. You know, it's a it's a good callback. But but I think we have this desire for that, and we're just not there. Right, right. I completely agree. Yeah. All right. Well, our thanks to uh, Liz Wharton from Scythe for joining us. As we said, always a pleasure to have her on the show. She is at Lawyer Liz on Twitter. So do check that out. She is a good follow for sure. And we want to thank our sponsors, Know Before. They are the social engineering experts and the pioneers of new school security awareness training. Be sure to take advantage of their free phishing test, which you can find at knowbefore.com slash fish test. Think of no before for your security training. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. The Caveat Podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Ben Yellen. Thanks for listening. Thank you.